much. Um, yes, my name is Nadia. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at Trinity College Dublin in Ireland. And today I'm talking about the experiment I ran with my colleagues um, at Trinity. So, in general, I'm interested in designing and measuring successful human machine interactions. And very often, quite successful, I mean that there is trust going on between the human um, and the agent. Uh, because without trust, um, whatever class the two um, human and agent have accomplished already will not uh, work out. And we, as designers of uh, the agent, and as designers of the interaction, we have several features that we can kind of tweak to make sure that the agent is perceived as trustworthy, for example. So we can work on the agent's face, so how it sounds like, on the agent's uh, sorry, how it looks like, on the agent's voice, how it sounds like, um, on its emotional expression, on how it moves, and so on. Um, and all of these things kind of um, elicit, can elicit a certain feeling of trustworthiness um, from the human perspective. Um, however, uh, when designing these kind of interactions, um, I'm always also striving to make sure that I'm designing something that resembles the kind of interaction as, as much as possible. So very often we see sort of um, lots of experiments that look at um, first impressions or explicit perceptions of trust, uh, such as questionnaires. But as we know from social psychology, quite often what people say they would do, or what people say they perceive, is actually different from what they actually do in an interaction. Um, so what I'm trying to do is measure actual behaviour. So for example, by designing games, where I can measure uh, people's trust by looking at how they behave in the game. And uh, one of the features that I've been interested in um, for creating trust in human agent interaction has been emotional expressivity. Um, so, um, emotions are something that is universal. I'm not going to go into details about universal theories of emotions and dimensional theories of emotions, but there's, you know, arguments for and cons both of them. But the signals, so the actual, um, the actual expressions um, of emotions uh, happening in human societies. So, we are kind of tuned to um, detect different emotions from people's faces and voices very quickly. Um, and as I was mentioning, we can design a machine's face and voice and body as we see fit. So what happens, for example, if we mismatch the two different modalities, modalities for example, audio and video, of emotional expressivity? What happens if we have a machine that is, say, expressing a certain emotion in the face and a different one in the voice? Is it going to be perceived as a third emotion, that if it had been one emotion expressed in one channel separately? Is it going to be acted upon differently? than if it had been one individual channel. Um, so this is what I'm going to be talking about today, of this sort of idea of an emotional McGurk effect. Uh, I hope you're all familiar with the McGurk effect. I'm not going to go through that now, but it's a pretty cool phenomenon. Um, so to create my uh, mismatched uh, emotional expression stimuli, I use motion capture. So we hired an Irish actor in the Mocap studio in Trinity College, um, and this actor was reading different sentences that we had pre-designed and that I'm going to describe a little bit better in a moment. Um, and he read these sentences in a neutral way and in a smiled way, so while smiling or while having a neutral expression. Um, and then we um, translated the facial movements into two different virtual characters, a cartoon-like agent on the left-hand side and a photorealistic agent on the right-hand side. Um, and after we applied this movement, so we have some smiling faces uh, with, with the cartoon-like and photorealistic agents, then we applied the audio from the same recordings um, in a mismatch, sort of I mixed and matched them. So basically, by the end, I had four different types of videos. So one video in which I had an agent that was smiling in the face and in the voice, um, a video in which the agent was neutral in the face and in the voice, then videos where the agent was smiling only in the face, and videos where the agent was smiling only in the voice. And these four different videos are going to be the basis of my um, experiment. And uh, as I was mentioning, I like to see how people behave um, in actual tasks, in actual games. So I designed a game based on the survival task. The survival task is a task that has been used in group um, psychology settings to um, examine the um, emergence of dominant speakers. Um, and in this game, the way we modified it, the participants imagine they have crash landed on the moon or on the desert, and they have only six intact objects with them. And they have to rank these objects in order of importance for survival. And then the artificial agent comes up and kind of suggests a slightly different ranking, and then we see whether people accept these suggestions. And all these objects that we used were taken from real, um, real tasks, 
designed by NASA and by some of those people who do, um, you know, experiences in the desert, desert survival for real. Um, and we took objects that were neither very important or very useless, so that people wouldn't have sort of very strong opinions as to which objects are really most important, so that none of these objects are really that important in the end. So, um, how does the game actually work? So, first of all, my participants would see an empty grid with these six positions, uh, one being most important and six being least important, and then they would make their ranking of the objects that they have available. So, for example, C, um, say I put my the radio, I deem it to be the most important, so I place it at position number one. And then I fill out the rest, which I'm not going to show here because uh, it would just be too much time. And then after participants have filled out the first column completely, a second grid appears, and this time this is for the um, artificial agent. And the artificial agent um, suggests a different ranking order in this column. So, and we designed the artificial agent to always change the position of the objects in a specified way. Uh, so, for example, regardless of whichever object the participant placed in position number one, the agent would place in position number five, so second least important. And then, whichever object the participant placed in position number two would go to position number four. Whichever object the participant placed in position number three would stay the same. And then, four would go to two, five to one, and six stay the same. And we had kind of this dynamic um, change in ranking because we were interested in seeing. So first of all, we didn't want our agent to be to appear like an annoying, know it all kind of personality. So we left two positions unchanged, and we also wanted our agent to show different ways of changing the position. So we could see, for example, if people were more likely to be persuaded to be in, to move an item up rather than down, and to move an item by a small distance rather than a big distance. So we have all this data. Um, oh yeah, and whenever the agent moves one of the objects, um, it describes that object in a certain way. So, um, if you remember, I was mentioning that um, we recorded the actor to read certain sentences. Well, these sentences were essentially descriptions of the object. Um, and we designed positive, negative and neutral descriptions, so that whenever the avatar would place one object in a certain position, it would play the corresponding description. And then finally, um, after all of this is done, um, the third grid would appear and the participants could place their, their items again. Um, and here, for example, if my participant places the radio in position number five, so the same position that the avatar suggested, this kind of tells me that the participant accepted the suggestion from the avatar. But if the participant places the radio back in position number one, so its original position, this instead tells me that um, there is not that much trust in the agent. But then what happens, for example, if participants place the radio position number two? Well, we interpreted this as being sort of a little bit, not 100% trust, but a little bit, you know, going towards trust towards the agents. So anything that was moved in the direction that the agent suggested, we interpreted as being, you know, a sign of a little bit of trust. And all of this is my implicit measure of knowledge-based trust. And now I would just like to play you some of the videos that we use for this uh, for, the, for the experiment. So let's see if you can tell which of my emotional expression conditions we have. I think I understand the better what the important systems are what the means of communication. So this is our photorealistic agent, which is smiling in the face and in the voice. I'm telling you just because we don't have enough time to go by hand and stuff. I think the machine are trying to what the important systems are only means of communication. This one is neutral face and neutral voice. I think the machine are transmitter would be important since it's our only means of communication. This is a neutral uh, voice and smiling face. I think the machine transmitter would be important since it's our only means of communication. And this is smiling voice and neutral face. And these were basically the different agents that my participants would interact with. I think. So uh, for the actual experiment, we called 80 participants who played two different games each. One with the lunar variant and one with the desert variant, all counter balance. And also our participants played one game with the cartoon-like agent and one game with the photorealistic agent, also counter balance. And then the four emotional expression conditions were counter balance between participants. Um, so yeah, people who play one game then answer a short questionnaire about the participant and then play the second game, sorry, about the agent, and then play the second game and answer another short questionnaire about the second agent. And now going to the results. 
So what we did is, um, as I was mentioning, we were interested in seeing whether people would be more likely to make, for example, small changes or big suggested changes. And indeed, we found that people were most likely to make the small suggested changes, so only two jumps up or down. Um, so here we have divided um, our results. We looked at the difference between the um, participants' final ranking and the agent's ranking um, for each individual position. So for the object, we were originally placed in position number two, so that the agent moved two positions down. We found that people were more likely to accept the suggestions with the cartoon-like agent. So they trusted the cartoon-like agent more. Um, and we also found that for objects that were originally placed at position number four, so that the agent then moved two positions up, participants were more likely to accept the suggestions from um, the agent that was neutral in the face and in the voice. Then in terms of explicit perception, so uh, people rated these agents in terms of realism, appeal, eeriness, trustworthiness, knowledge, attractiveness, intelligence and happiness. The happiness one was kind of a safety check to make sure that they were smiling was actually perceived a little bit as a smile. Um, and here I'm only reporting the statistically significant ones. So um, we didn't find any effect of emotional expression, but we found that people rated the photorealistic agent as more realistic, but also as more eerie. Um, and the people rated the cartoon-like agent as more appealing, more attractive, um, and also happier, um, which is quite interesting as well. So, to kind of sign ev sum everything up, we found that people uh, really did make different trusting behaviors, trusting decisions based on the age of appearance, so cartoon-like or photorealistic, um, and emotional expression. So one of these four mismatched conditions that we had. And that they tended to trust the um, agent that was neutral in the face and voice more, and the cartoon agent more. Um, regarding the um, explicit perceptions, we found that people trusted the happy, sorry, that people rated the cartoon-like agent as happier. But it's kind of interesting because both of them had exactly the same sort of smiling movement. So maybe it's just the case that cartoons are generally meant, you know, to be more expressive. So just because of that, people rated them higher in terms of happiness. Um, and finally, I just want to spend one word about what I'm doing next. So I'm going to use the fur hat robot, which is a robot that has a projector in the back of its head, to see whether, and I'm going to project these avatar faces on the fur hat, and see whether having the robot kind of sharing your presence with you, rather than having an agent on the computer, makes a difference into how much you're trusting them. Um, and I'm also going to feed all of my videos on the kind of work and see how people place them um, in a kind of dimensional um, grade of emotion. And I'd like to thank my collaborators with Trinity and you for um, listening to me and other questions. Any questions? Yes, about two. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is, did you try to put context in picture? For example, if you give them a risky task or a financial task or portion, will they trust the cartoon? Okay. Well, um, the context was this kind of crash landing. So um, they were told in, uh, in text uh, terms that they had crash landed on the moon or on the desert, blah, blah, blah. And then they saw pictures of the, all the different objects and descriptions of the objects. Um, so that was it. There was no graphical representation because we wanted people to be sort of not paying too much attention to the, the rest of the task and just think about whether they were uh, accepting the suggestions from the agent or not. That is answering your question. Second question. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering the fact that the people trusted more the cartoon agent could it be also related to the Anthony Valley effect? Like, yeah, yeah, it could be definitely. Um, so um, you know, very often in human machine interaction, people are like, "Oh, our agents should definitely be more morphic because reasons." Uh, but actually, when you look at how people actually behave, sometimes. It might be better to have a you know an anthropomorphic agent, also because people might form very high expectations of a very anthropomorphic agent, and then when those expectations are not met for whatever reason, that is a problem. So you might want to start with a you know less anthropomorphic agent to begin with, so that the expectations, if anything, are exceeded and not uh, reduced. Uh, did you consider or are you considering um, using sort of more uh, sort of vocal and facial expressions 
you know, in the experiment, so for instance, some of you guys were neutral and happy, but you could have had a concerned voice or a fearful voice. Or yeah, this is interesting. So we used specifically the smiling. We didn't say happy. We always said smiling because um, the, 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 the smiling expression has lots of different functions. So it can be you know joyful smiling, so happy smiling, of course, but also sad, very sad. It can be all sorts of. It can have all sorts of functions in the interaction. So we were wondering if we had different types of smiling in the face and voice, would people perceive it to be sarcastic, for example, and therefore maybe trust the agent less. Um, so that is the reason we chose an expression rather than a label of an emotion. Um, and also because smiling is definitely uh, hearable in the voice. So if you're on the phone with someone and they're smiling, you can kind of tell um, that they are. And it's, it's identifiable as an expression rather than an emotion. I yeah, I guess sense. I was thinking in terms of the context of the tasks, being that they were you know, survival tasks and therefore you know, a serious situation, there are you know, a number of expressions or, or what have you that I kind of understood why neutral was chosen because I think you know, smiling yeah. seemed to be counter. You know. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Um, that is what, why we think that people preferred the neutral uh, because the agent, yeah, having a, an agent smile at you and saying, oh, I think you should select this object because otherwise you are going to die is probably a bit, uh, yeah, uncanny as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks, thanks to speaker once and one more time.